Hey, oboists, have you checked out MKL Reads lately? MKL is the one-stop shop for handmade oboe reads where you can try reads from various makers and then select the one that is best for you. How cool is that? Visit mklreads.com and enter coupon code double space read space dish, all caps, for free shipping on your first order. Don't you hate feeling bored with all the music on your stand? Well, luckily, you never have to feel that way again. JDW Sheet Music offers a wide variety of chamber music pieces for wind players of all ages. Their catalog includes duets, trios, quintets, and even double reed choir pieces for beginner, intermediate, and advanced players. Each of the pieces on the site will include sample pages, audio excerpts, and short descriptions. JDW Sheet Music has also made it possible to access the music sooner through the new digital download-only feature. Pieces that are marked digital download only will be made available immediately after purchase. To learn more about JDW Sheet Music, please visit www.jdwsheetmusic.com. Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson. And you're listening to Double Read Dish, a podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. Galit. Jackie. We're here. And we sound so good. <laughs> <laughs> so not to just jump right in, but it is very relevant. The dish topic today is epiphanies we've had over the summer that we're taking into back to school. Uh-huh. And while I guess technically we're taking this into back to school, it's more of a podcast epiphany. Yeah. So... Not to peek behind the curtain too much, but we, (laughs) you know, have our system or have up to this point had a system for recording the podcast Mm -hmm. and learned maybe about three weeks ago that starting September 1st, that way was no longer going to be valid. The program was going away and we weren't going to be able to use it anymore. Which sparked a panic. Yes. <laughs> well, because as we've talked about before, we just kind of figured this out, reaching uh-huh. our way through the dark and then grasping onto whatever <laughs> thing we found. <laughs> and um, in the process of researching, found actually a bunch of different options. And the one that has turned out to be the best for us is um, perhaps more affordable than the last option, is easier to use will significantly expand the way that we reach guests and therefore expanding the number and type of guest artists that we can have on the podcast and has significantly better sound quality. Hallelujah. (laughs) And I just have to say credit where credit is due. You said that we researched... (laughs) That was false. You researched it. It was all you. I am not going to take any kind of credit for this. Well, it may have been me who did the research, but it's also me who did not do the research. And by that, I mean, one of my epiphanies for this summer, (laughs) I was telling you before we started recording, is... Be curious, which is um, my teacher, Ben Quelio, always said that if I have one priority for my students, it's that they be curious. So in theory, I learned for at least three years to be curious and the value of being curious, but apparently I've forgotten it (laughs) because we were on, in terms of our tech, a lather, rinse, repeat, and this option that we're using now has in theory at least been available to us the entire time. And if I had simply been curious and done the research earlier, we could have had this great option. And in fact, we're talking about this in part because we have done a lot of pre-recorded interviews. Mm -hmm. And so we may be in a scenario where the dish is of one quality and then the interview sounds a little bit different. You know, I don't feel like the last way was sounding like we were, you know, using tin cans on a wire extended. (laughs) Like, (laughs) Although that would be fun. 
That would be really fun. That would be. It, it would require a lot a of strength. really long wire. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I guess I would say to people, it made me say to myself, am I doing things the right way, the most effective way, the most efficient way? And lather, rinse, repeat is not the best policy. So learn from my mistakes, people. Well, also, like a little self-forgiveness. We are not full-time NPR hosts. Unfortunately. (laughs) So we really were reaching out in the dark and figuring out how to do it. And what, you know, the, what we were doing was working. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so it's really easy to say, okay, well, it's working. I don't want to potentially ruin a bunch of interviews with these really amazing guests moving to a new technology. So, you know, it's totally understandable, I think, that we would be like, okay, well, let's play it safe. And then we, when we were forced to change, then we realized that a new way could be better. So. Well, and to be fair, it, going back to the last episode and our hesitations about starting it in the first place, in uh-huh. that it would just be too time consuming. You and I both agreed, you know, the podcast is wonderful and, and it's a priority for us, but it can't get in the way of our practice time. It can't get in the way of giving good performances. It can't get in the way of doing our faculty positions and, and that type of thing. So mm-hmm. maybe that was another, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> And you're welcome. (laughs) So I have another epiphany, but I want to hear your summer reflections and what you've been thinking about. So I think the biggest one that has been important for me this summer is just to trust. Just trust. And that's hard for me. I don't know if you've met me before, Jackie, but (laughs) (laughs) trusting that things are going to work out okay and that everything's going to be fine is really a hard sell to mm-hmm. somebody like me. <laughs> and I'm not exactly sure why I might be a little bit of a control freak, but we don't have to get into that so much. Um, but I've been working on just saying, okay, this situation came up or that happened or, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to freak out. I'm going to trust that everything's going to be okay. And lo and behold, everything's still okay. So. Mm-hmm. That's been my biggest thing. Well, that's important for us as musicians is there's a lot of uncertainty in what we do. Holy moly. It's true. And, you know, it's easy to get lost in self-doubt and, um, you know, especially once you're out in the working world, it feels like the stakes are very high for everything that you do. So, you know, just to say, okay, well, I'm going to do my best and I'm going to trust that everything's going to be okay. And usually everything is okay. Well, and also trust that you can't see around corners. And there have been times that I, there was one point in my life where I wasn't super happy with the way things were. And I knew that I was going to be doing that thing the following year. And then within weeks, I found a new opportunity at my doorstep and I was Mm -hmm. moving across the country and you know, in minutes, my life changed. And I had spent a lot of time that previous year resigned to the disappointment that I was stuck in something that it turned out I wasn't stuck in long term. So right. you, there are always corners that we don't even know we can't see around. Trust and faith is a hard one for me, but I'm really working on it because it seems to be the right answer in just about every situation where I don't feel like I have control. Trust. Okay, so I'll say my second epiphany, which um, I actually had in June. I went to the Lunar Festival, which was... um, co-directed by a friend of the podcast, Laura Medisky. Shout out to Laura. Shout out, Laura. I actually wanted to make it a point to talk about the Lunar Festival. Um, it's It was its inaugural year in Madison, Wisconsin, and it was this three-day festival celebrating women in the arts. So it's capital A art. There was monologue. There was poetry reading. There were concerts, photography. There was all sorts of stuff by... Um, just celebrating women's creativity. It was 
such a cool event. First of all, it was super cool to see my friend kind of conceive of this idea and then put all the work in and then be there to see it come to fruition. That was really kind of a almost sentimental experience. Mm -hmm. But it was so cool to see an idea become something that people didn't even know they needed. And the audiences were so excited and hungry for this type of discussion and this type of programming. The first concert, which had this kind of like palpable excitement to it, I was playing last. And so I was, you know, that awkward, like I don't play for a long time, but I have to be ready to play. And so I was um, kind of hanging out backstage and these two um, kind of older women got done performing and they came backstage and they had tears in their eyes and they hugged and they talked about how validated and empowered they felt in this particular circumstance. And I was just like, wow, this is a byproduct of this festival that Laura and her partner Eva couldn't maybe have even anticipated. I was driving home just thinking about what a good job it was thinking about the work that I had played. One of the works I played was by Valerie Coleman, who of course is in the Imani Winds. Love, 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 love. And I'm obsessed with the Imani Winds. I'm obsessed with Monica Ellis as a bassoonist of color. I think we're all obsessed with Monica Ellis. She's mm-hmm. just so important. Toy and Spellman Diaz. Toy and Spellman, yeah. Mm-hmm. And they were, this work was written for Monica and Toyin. And so I introduced the work. So I was actually reflecting a lot on the Imani winds and their um, role that they have played in classical woodwind playing. And I was driving home and I was thinking, you know, Lunar Art Festival, Imani winds. At one point, these were just ideas. Mm-hmm. This was, this was just a brainchild that someone had that everyone has. And for a lot of us, we just go, oh, that would be cool someday. And how important it is to me that the Imani winds actually became what they are and how important it was to the people impacted by Lunar Art Festival. And that was kind of my epiphany. Well, not to toot toot, but Double Read Dish <laughs> at one point was just a brainchild, mm-hmm. you know, and we've gotten a lot of feedback that the interviews we've done and, and the function we serve in the Double Read community is important to people. And so my epiphany was just, if you have an idea, do it. Follow through. Yes. Follow through. Do it. It's important. It is not insurmountable. If it feels insurmountable, find a partner, find a good Mm -hmm. friend to do it with. That is so important, I think, because you can't expect to be great at every aspect of building something. Right. Like if it hadn't been for your incredible diligence and follow through, double redish never would have happened. Honestly. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just holding up a big sunshine heart for Jackie right now. <laughs> but there are there, you know, there are roles that you play in this that I could never and, and and really prefer not to. And and yeah, it's an important partnership. So maybe you have an idea that you're like, uh, and you just need to find the right partner to do your idea with. But mm-hmm. yeah, that that was one of my big epiphany. It's not that I don't have enough big projects on my plate, but for the (laughs) listeners, that idea that you have in your head, that method book that you think would be cool or that album idea or going back to Midori Sampson's Mavericks episode and the ideas that she had and has for commissioning new works by African composers and stuff. Like if you have an idea, it's valid and it's worthy and you just need to do it. Cosign. Cool. Well, we asked you guys what your back to school summer epiphanies are, and we had someone share with us. Yes. So Dylan shared that his musical epiphany this summer is that he needs to spend a lot more time practicing to hit everything. Um, this works out really well. He, I'll just read what he, what he writes in his own words. Uh, this works out really well for me, though, because I plan my schedule. So I would have three hours of practice time right in the middle of the day. So knowing that from period three to period nine, I can have uninterrupted practice time really helps me progress quickly. I was so impressed with that comment because it shows a lot of maturity. I also recently realized about myself is that I cannot do anything after dinner. I keep thinking that I can, like I keep thinking, oh, well, I still have a chance to do X, Y, and Z after dinner, but I just, 
it is the biggest waste of time because I'm completely unfocused and exhausted. So to schedule it in your day so it's a concrete time, um, that's genius. That's awesome. I agree. Yeah. Schedule it, but also schedule it during a high productivity time, schedule low impact activities during your, yeah, after dinner or whenever. There are some people who are really great at night. I'm not one of them, but yeah, I'm my most productive in the morning, usually before lunch. And so that's when I try to get in a lot of my practicing, but also what Dylan's talking about entering the practice room with a plan. Mm-hmm. And it seems like, well, duh, but there, <laughs> there are a lot of things that are well duh that we forget to do all the time or we don't hold ourselves accountable. I think sometimes it's also a little bit self sabotage and a little bit fear-based, you know, like I know that if I get my practicing done in the morning and early afternoon, I'm going to feel great the rest of the day. But sometimes it's hard to get myself in the room because I'm afraid of the possible failure of, pra- I mean, in practicing, you're confronting the things that are hardest So there's always the possibility that you won't be able to do it, right? You'll in some way fail. So that's, I think for me, that's part of it too, is that, oh, maybe I actually can't learn this measure or maybe I actually can't do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And we usually wait till the end of the episode to talk about who we're having on next time. But this, this is all reminding me of the conversation we had with Nancy Goris, Mm -hmm. which is coming up on the next episode that if, if this conversation we're having with us and Dylan is igniting um, some thoughts in you. Make sure to check out Nancy's episode because she just takes us all to church with this type of talk. Absolutely. Trust. Trust. Hey guys, let me tell you something. Jenna Ingle loves the oboe. She's built her business on providing high quality handmade reads, education, and a sympathetic ear to oboists across the country. When you order from Jenna Ingle Reads, you get prompt communication, reads or cane handcrafted to your specifications, and cheerful, friendly customer service. All orders are mailed within one week, sometimes much faster. Single orders and monthly read subscriptions are also welcome, and she's going to work with you to find the right combination of response, resistance, stability, and flexibility that's right for you. Double Read Dish listeners can use the code DISH, that's all caps, for 10% off your first order at JennetIngle.com. Everyone knows that Genda Industries is known for their reed knives, sharpening, and overall amazing quality and service in the double reed world. But there is so much more going on at Genda Industries. Did you know you can get oboe and bassoon reeds from Genda Industries Artisan Mall? The Genda Industries Artisan Mall is like a farmer's market filled with talented local and regional reed makers selling their reeds. It's a great way to try out some new reeds from new makers. Who knows? One day they may be your reeds for sale. Add the code DRDGENDA, all caps, no spaces, at checkout and get 10% off any Genda reed knife, maintenance kit, reed knife sharpening book, cutting block, and read tool roll. Visit them at www.gendaindustries.com. Oh, and they're more than just read knives. We are very excited to welcome to the podcast, Allison Teal, Principal English Horn with the BBC Symphony Orchestra. Welcome to Double Read Dish. Hi. Can we start off? Our first standard question is asking how you came to play the oboe and maybe even how you came to have the English horn be a prominent part of your life as well. Absolutely. Now, I I really wish I could give some very romantic reason as to how I'd heard the oboe across a crowded room in an orchestral concert (laughs) and thought that was the instrument of my dreams. However, the reality was um, I'd been playing the piano for a long time and I was about to start a new school. And um, in England, I don't know how it is in, in America, but in England, um, when I was growing up, you, you got to tick a box as to the instrument that you you wanted to play. Now, somehow in the process of the ticking of the boxes, um, I, I don't know. I don't know which parent to blame, either my mother or my father. But um, I wanted to play the clarinet. That's all I wanted to do. I wanted to play the clarinet. Anyway, so I went to my first oboe lesson thinking it was a clarinet. And I think for about a year, 
I thought I was playing a clarinet or a type of clarinet. <laughs> and my my father, you know, kept putting on Akabilk <laughs> and kept saying, you know, you know, the sound you're making is is really uh, not like a clarinet. And I'm like, no, no. But, but, you know, I've got the same instrument as what my teacher's got. And, you know, I didn't really, we just kind of accepted it. I'm not from a musical family. I think we, we can assume that. Well, they look and, similar. Oh, well, they black. I, I mean, everyone, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's just so funny. So when people go, oh, what do you play? And I go, oh, the oboe. And then what, what's it look like? Oh, it looks like a clarinet. I mean, because I really get it. I really understand. So it was a, a very happy accident. And, um, of course, not many people played the oboe. So so in the end, it, it worked out quite neatly. Um, the romantic reason for playing the uh, Kuronglei, again, is a is another non-romantic reason, as it were. Um, I, I had my job in Hong Kong, um, and after, I think I was there for about six years. And um, part of my job there was to play sort of all three parts, principal, second, and uh, Kuronglei. Oh, yeah, that's a core for us, isn't it, as opposed to English horn. And um, I came back from Hong Kong to the UK and quite quickly realised that a freelance musicianship lifestyle was not uh, going to work for me. Not uh, for any other reasons than I actually really liked a salary. That's really bad. But I just I think it's in my (laughs) sort of psychology that I just like to know how much I'm going to get paid each month, when I'm going to work. And, um, you know, you create your own flexibility around that. So the job in the BBC Welsh Orchestra, National Orchestra of Wales, came up uh, quite soon after I'd returned to the UK. And I thought, OK, I'm going to work really hard for that job because it's a good orchestra, well paid, nice perks, go. And so I had, um, I mean, you know, at college, we always have to play English horn anyway. But I had a few lessons with Christine Pendrell, who's the uh, core player in the LSO, Um and and I just kind of really put my head down and thought, right, I need a salary. And uh, that was that. So it's not it's not <laughs> sort of anything other than kind of it wasn't a, a career path by any stretch of imagination. It's been a, um, a happy hazard of uh, mistakes, I'd say. So, yeah, there we go. <laughs> so when you were auditioning for the. BBC National Orchestra of Wales. What was your process like? You had been co-principal oboe with Hong Kong, and then you won an English horn audition. What was that process like? How did you, did you have to primarily switch over mm-hmm. and play Coranglay, or did you have to, you know, how did that process work for you? Well, it was, again, I think it was a, um, I th- the actual process of the audition was, um, I guess I really looked at myself in a new way. And that sounds, I don't mean to be pretentious at all, but I think actually doing that audition specifically for the core really got me listening to myself. And I think, I mean, actually, Christine was quite formidable and um, very encouraging. I think I maybe only had about four or five lessons from her, but I was so motivated by her I used to remember writing all the, these lists of things to to look at. And after lessons, I'd come home and immediately practice um, and record myself. Um, it, I, I really was driven by fear, which, again, isn't a, a good thing to necessarily admit. But I knew that I, I needed to have a job. Otherwise, I just wouldn't continue playing at all. It, it just it, it just isn't. Um, isn't an option for me. I need to have a job. Um, so, yeah, it, in those moments, it was just pure focus, listening, obviously making reads. Again, I have to say I wasn't um, very on it, in inverted commas. It was a, a, a lots of mistakes. And um, when I got the job, I think that is when I actually learned how to play the core anglais. Um because one feels, I think, as a, a non-core anglais player, that it's much easier to play the core than a, an oboe. 
um, you feel that the reads last longer, you feel that it's easier, all these things, you know, um, mm-hmm. I don't know how many people you know, have a Coronglay read, it lasts for about six months. I used to be like that. I thought, oh, well, if I get the Coronglay job, it's going to be super simple. It just isn't. It just is exactly the same. You're you're as prominent as the other parts, if not more prominent. You know, how many other times do you get to be left alone Um when the rest of the orchestra stops playing, you know, you, it's a very exposed part, mm-hmm. um, opposition, should I say. Um, so it was, it was a, a good learning curve and a, and a good exploration of myself in short. <laughs> Could we backtrack a little bit and have you tell us about your training educational journey and the process of choosing to pursue music professionally? Sure. I think for me, I started off, as I said, uh, on the piano and I began the oboe when I was 11. Um, I've, after about sort of four years of playing the oboe, I, I learned with a, a local teacher. And um, at 15, I think maybe 15 or 16, I ended up uh, going on to the National Youth Orchestra. Of, uh, it was the wind band. So the National Wind Band of Great, uh, of Great Britain, I think it was called. And I kind of realized just how other people were being taught and what other facilities they had to their sort of uh, repertoire, you know, be it. I, no one had ever spoken to me about embouchures or breathing or vibrato. And I realized then that actually, if I was going to take this seriously, I needed to perhaps look at different teachers. So I went to a, a, a fantastic guy called Philip Cull up in, in Tyneside and um, ended up going to, um, through his help, through going to Cheetons, which is a music school in Manchester, and spent two years there. And then after that, um, went to Guildhall. So, I th- and I think going to Cheetons, which I said, which is a specialist school for six, well, I went for 16 to 18 to do my A-levels. Um, I think one of the reasons I went down that avenue was because I was actually taking so much time off my regular day school to do musical activities. And it just seemed like a sort of sensible option to do. Um I th- again, I'm not from a musical family, and I think we often say that perhaps in hindsight, as much as Cheetons is a fantastic school, um, perhaps for me, what could have been a better route would have been to have gone for a, they have Saturday music schools here, which were uh, um, linked to the conservatoire, so you get junior departments, mm. and I think that might have been a more um, holistic approach for me. It's not to say I had a bad time at Cheetons at all, but I think um, I'm someone that enjoys having a wide base um, of activities and interests. So uh, it felt very narrow quite quickly for me. Um, But yeah, so I went to Guildhall, studied there for four years uh, and was quite fortunate that I sort of in my um, fourth year, which is the final year of my Guildhall education, my uh, cousin, who's a dentist, had already got her career mapped out. And I remember feeling, thinking, oh, Lord, you know, I must... I must start thinking, what am I going to do? Am I going to do a postgrad? And um, I decided just to go for a job. I thought, well, you know, at some point I've got to go for a job, see see what happens. And so it was lucky coincidence that the Hong Kong job came up. So before I'd finished my degree, I knew that in the September I had a job to go to. Um, and, and, and from that point in, it's been sort of, you know, opportunities as musicians, they, they are random, aren't they? You know, it, mm-hmm. it depends which chair becomes available and which orchestra when. So you, and I think that it's, it's not like, you know, um, years gone by when you were in an electricity shop and you could work your way up through the various mm-hmm. management roles, you know, and I, and I think it's always about being flexible, isn't it? So, so uh, that's my education <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Well, I think that's a really important point because a lot, we can we can hold ourselves back sometimes by thinking, well, I'm at this stage, so I'm not ready for that. Absolutely. And um, and I think, again, my father was, I remember when I was in my third year, my dad almost telling me off, you know, come on, Alison, when are you going to start applying for jobs? And of course, I was like, oh, I'm so terrified, you know, because you, you look at professionals and you, you put them on a pedestal because they're amazing. And you, you, there is sort of an arrogance, isn't there, to think, am I mm-hmm. possibly as good as that to start auditioning for a professional job? You know, how dare I assume that I'm of the same level of them? But mm-hmm. at some point, you have to bite the bullet and think, right, I want to do this. Come on, let's go for it. And uh, sadly, you know, as a musician, you, you face fear a lot. And uh, another friend of mine said to me, you know, if we didn't have fear, just think about all the things that we would do. 
And I think that that's the thing. It's like we worry so much about what other people think and all the rest of it. And being on the other side of the audition panel now, you know, I just think that most musicians just want everyone to do well. So it's not it, it, auditions aren't something to be afraid of, I'd say. I'd go for it. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, over here we have uh, a phrase that we use to describe what you just talked about, which is imposter syndrome. And it sometimes goes along with the performance anxiety. But um, you also teach at Guildhall. And I wonder if, do you have any anything else that you can tell us about, you know, feeling, how to conquer the feeling of I'm not as good as they think I am, people are going to see through me. Our listeners always love hearing um, from our guests about, you know, any advice they can give for feelings like that. Um, well, I guess I, I can't. I can't think of anything sort of straight away that makes me think, oh, I can give advice on how to kind of overcome it. Because um, I was one of the things that sort of um, strikes me is actually, I think if you look around the profession, 90% of the musicians would feel similar. You know, I think we all have great self-doubts. And I think it's the great self-doubt that's actually the motivator to keep us practicing and to try to hone those skills. So um, I think it's... I, I know when I was doing auditions, I used to imagine, I, and this is where I go a little bit crazy here, so go with this, but I used to imagine that, um, you know, practicing, you'd have sort of like two people sitting on your shoulders, and it'd be like the the, the angel and the devil in many ways, but uh, when you're practicing, you need that negative voice to, to kind of goad you, to encourage, but basically to kind of point out the faults, and during the audition, you have to say goodbye to that bad person and you need your little friendly face that's kind of going right you've done the work you've got to trust in yourself and you've just got to do it and I I think for me a lot of it is about hard consistent work you're never going to win an audition on five minutes practice it's that it's that it's, it's like running a marathon isn't it you have to put in the training you have to put in the miles and it's exactly the same with playing the oboe. Of course, you need artistry and musicality, but you need to have the the hours of practice in the bank. A lot, a lot of um, young people, I'd say, have to make up the hours that professionals have just by practice. You know, there's a lot of skill that professionals acquire just by doing the job. You can't just get. You've got to do it for by in practice. Um, that hasn't really answered the question I know, but there we go. (laughs) No, it's great advice. I think it's, it's sometimes we have to turn up the volume on one voice and turn down the volume on the other. Well, yes. Our listeners also love to get audition recommendations and perspective. And you spoke about everything you've learned from the other side and now being on the audition committees and panels. And so I wonder if you could expand on what you've learned being on the other side, the typical pitfalls that you see people who audition making and what makes Mm -hmm. someone really stand out in that context. The first thing I would say would be that when you walk in the room, a candidate that sparkles and fizzes and enthuses is someone that is immediately attractive. I don't care, you know, about what a bad day you've had if you've walked through the door because it's a new person. That sounds, again, bad, but it's like we're basically auditioning for someone to join, not only to play with us, but to be social. So we, we want to see a nice person walk through the door. That's that's the first thing. So so with those first few steps to, to walk in, I know that there's a lot of blind auditions, but um, these days when we don't we don't do blind auditions with the symphony orchestra, um, people walk into a room, a nice cheery smile, hello, goes a long long way. Mm. Um, then come the performance, don't faff around tuning too long. Be confident. You've done the A. You've you've warmed up. Take an A from the piano. Be confident. And um, again, the panel only wants you to do well. It's not about ticking boxes for negativity. I think um, one of the major pitfalls is when people start trying to be perfect. Uh, Again, for me, that's a bit boring. Um, I'd much rather people just went for it and made a massive, great big boo-boo in the process. (laughs) But because I think it's, it's not... 
I've never thought, oh, well, that trill there is not quite accurate. Oh, and, and the way that they did that diminuendo, it, it, it's all about, you know, you have to deliver yourself. You have to be your true person. And um, because that's that's what you're going to be. I think ultimately as well, you, you know, you, there's a lot of um, people will say, oh, you know, what is it that this orchestra wants or whatever? But going for a job or, you know, in the England, we have trial processes. So you go for an interview, then you kind of, I mean, audition, sorry, not interview. And then you end up sort of sitting in the chair for a couple of weeks here, a couple of weeks there. And it is like a relationship. I think if you, if you, if you try to be false in any way and try to adapt your playing, you're always going to have to be a different player, a different person. And that's never going to sit well. So you, you have to be yourself. You have to perform genuinely and with emotion. And I think that is what makes performers stand out. It's, it's yourself. You're bringing yourself to the podium, as it were. Mm-hmm. Switching gears a little bit. I know that you arrange music for oboe band. And you just came from a unique oboe band experience just a few days ago. And I would love to hear more about that. Um, well, this little sort of uh, experiment happened about I don't know, six or seven years ago. My, my parents live in France in, uh, the, in the Limoges region. And they live in the middle of nowhere. And um, actually, music's quite a big part of their lives for one reason or another. Um, not that they sing in any choirs, but they help behind choirs. And mum started having piano lessons. And so music's really active there. And um, I guess ages ago, I took a wind quintet there and noticed that wherever we played, the halls were absolutely packed. So I thought, wouldn't it be great to bring some students? I mean, this is, you know, why on earth I should think this. But I ended up bringing students from Guildhall um, over to my parents' house, you know, as you do. We'd all stay <laughs> under there. And uh, we'd, you know, stay for a few days, practice, and then put on a couple of concerts. And then in the in the meantime, we'd go on little day trips here, there and everywhere so we could see the region. And and in a way, it was it was a way to kind of bond the oboe department more than anything else and kind of um, have have fun whilst playing. The last one I've done was a, uh, was the smallest group I've done, uh, and that was six students. Uh, four were from Guildhall, and two were kind of private students, really. Um, but uh, So there was one bassoon and um, five oboes. And the difference with this one as well was that I actually played along. Normally I conduct, which probably puts them off more than anything else. In my <laughs> and so, but what's incredible is that uh, the only reason it's really possible is that there's a, a choir that we kind of attach ourselves to. So we end up uh, putting on a concert for just the oboe band. And then we end up playing with a choir and with it, that's with a local um, orchestra as well or not. It, it's just a fantastic experience. And this last one, this last little group, um, there was one postgrad, uh, three first year students, a bassoonist that wasn't actually studying music but plays bassoon. He used to be in the National Youth Orchestra of Great Britain, so he's pretty hot. And a 16- or 15-year-old uh, private student of mine called uh, Bridget. And it was such a, a, a wonderfully warm environment where no there were no egos, and it just worked so well. So we've already been booked to go back as the six or seven of us next year. So we're sort of we we did um, anything from Queen of Sheba for seven oboes, mm-hmm. which was always interesting. Right, right down <laughs> to a version of uh, Mamma Mia medley for ABBA, which I have to say went down an absolute storm. Had a kicking bass line, so uh, we had, uh, we, we've had a lot of fun. And I think, and I think the, the the thing that really really struck me was actually, even though we were having fun, everybody worked really really hard and uh, played to the best of their ability. And I just was so proud of them all. It was just, it was just so much fun. Anyway, so that's, it's this sort of crazy little venture that, um, I don't know, just brings back the joy of playing, really. I love it. Can you <laughs> describe to us your approach to read making, your routines, your habits, and what advice do you have for read making uh, for our listeners? Um Again, it, it, look, I mean, I, I can be very flippant and I, I try to take oboe playing and reads to the to, to be slightly flippant because, you know, I think being an oboist is unbelievably stressful. 
So a few years ago, I decided to uh, sort of go for the unemotional read maker approach. And uh, instead of hand scraping everything, I just went to profiles. And it might be lazy, but the the thing I found is that um, I I feel that preparation is everything. So you always need loads of blanks. That's the key. If you've got a blank and you've got a profiler, chances are you're going to find a read that works. Being organized is important. So at the moment where we've just started the proms and the proms is this big festival in the UK and my orchestra, we have 13 proms each year. So it's over a two month period. So we're looking at sort of, you know, two, sometimes three proms a week of different programs. So there's not much time. We sometimes get a day off between each concert. Um, and so I, I tied on, I've got sort of about 40 Coronglay reads tied on and the equivalent in oboe reads so that over the course of the next couple of months I don't have to worry about the tying on I maybe profile sort of 10 and leave them and then come back to them a few days later um I try not to get too involved um if a read works at that time brilliant and I'll go with that I'll leave them and you know as the weather and seasons change I'll revisit um so I've always got uh, um, a load of reads to kind of keep going um, I hate having that feeling of that you don't have anything. And so I try to avoid it. But yeah, I think the more organised you can be, the less stressful it is. And so particularly Guildhall, there's, the students aren't allowed to use profilers. Initially, they need to learn how to scrape a read. And I think it's absolutely imperative to know how to adjust a read. Uh, but then, of course, I don't practice what I preach and as a profiler now. <laughs> <laughs> well, profiling is becoming a growing trend here, too. I think because the the physical um, wear and tear on your body over a long career of hand scraping every read just becomes yeah. a lot. And, I, and also, you know, you talk about wear and tear of your body. I mean, you, you know, instruments are heavier we're expected to practice more. I think things have changed. And, you know, I don't use a sling when I play the cor anglais. And so I'm very aware that, you know, I mean, I know a lot of people do. But to, to counteract that, yeah, you, it's important to, to look after yourself. And so definitely, yeah, profiling, way to go. <laughs> so you mentioned BBC at the proms and those of us who have been on YouTube have seen these, you know, wonderfully produced concerts. What is it like? Obviously, the heat of live performance always has an intensity to it, but maybe it's my own performance anxiety speaking, but I would <laughs> anticipate that it's a little bit different when you know this is going to be broadcast, this is going to be in people's homes, on their televisions. Does that add an extra element? And if so, how do you deal with that? Um, does it add an extra element? I would be lying if it if I said no. Um, I, I I think actually oh, um, I've been in this orchestra ten years now, and that that's not to add gravitas to the situation. But in that time, there's been a number of camera changes. So uh, I'd say up until about even three years ago, they used to put cameras actually in the orchestra, sometimes on a, a train track. And oh. <laughs> Let's just say, you know, yeah. And then sometimes those things that look like something from outer space, they're like this ball and they'd be on a tripod. And then in the concert, you'd see it go round and, you, you know, and it would look at you. And that's not disconcerting at all. Oh, no, no, no. And you and it's it's interesting. So thank God they are not anywhere near us now. So what happens is um, you can hear, you can see out of the corner of your eye these massive booms you know, be kind of coming towards you. So the that there's two the, the two principal concerts that kind of um, scare me, and they do scare me, are the first night of the proms and the last night of the proms. The ones in the middle, I think I kind of get used to and can kind of kind of calm down. But the first night of the proms, um, I mean, it, it's it's part of the orchestral year that I absolutely love. I mean, it's high intensity, high octane amazing programs, packed audiences of 6,000 people in the actual Albert Hall. It's amazing. But that first night when you walk onto the hall and you haven't been there for about 10 months and you see everybody, sometimes, I don't know, we've, we have a, somebody described it the other day as like walking into Kew Gardens. And what they mean by that is they have these incredible Victorian 
uh, glass houses and the humidity so high. It is like an equatorial rainforest as you go in. The humidity rises. Your reeds do extraordinary things. And the heat. <laughs> and, you you know, you can feel the sweat dripping up down your back. I mean, it's it's really not a very glamorous setup. But you're sitting there trying to be all poised because you know there's a camera that's about, and, you know, the people at home are going to be looking. And actually, my neighbours love it because they see me in the street. Oh, Ali, we saw you on the telly the other night. I'm like, oh, thank you very much. You know? <laughs> and, then, um, and then, of course, the last night of the proms. Now, the last night of the proms is something that is very, um, I don't know, very special to me um, because uh, when I was very little, we're looking at like four or five, um, I remember going to see my grandparents up in uh, Scotland with uh, mum and dad. And they, their house was really, really tiny. And in one room, they had the, the, the living, the dining table. In the other room, they had like a sofa. And my granddad was really keen on uh, sounds. So he had these immense speakers. And again, in the 70s, the televisions were, uh, you know, as wide as they were deep. I mean, they were so huge. They had all this mm-hmm. garbage going on behind them. But the sound quality was a bit rubbish. So uh, before digital era, era, you could put the radio on. So Radio 3 would be on. You could hear the concert live. And my con- uh, my granddad would turn the television sound down so we'd get the live version through the television with the sound of the speakers from Radio 3. Ooh. And I remember my dad waking me up to listen specifically to the second half of the last night of the proms. And so I have this sort of deep, deep memory of being in this tiny, tiny living room, sitting on my dad's knee, listening to all the pomp and circumstance and seeing all the flags and him, you know, making me clap along and singing along to Jerusalem. I mean, I loved it. So the very first prom I did after that, when, I mean, the very first prom, my last night of the proms, I remember going on the stage and kind of feeling just this overwhelming sort of, I don't know, just emotion of, oh my God, how am I here? You know, how is this happening? And being on the stage and kind of remembering this tiny room and not even at four knowing what an oboe was, it's quite a remarkable journey. So, so now when I'm, on, when I'm on the stage for the last night of the proms, even though I might not actually be doing very much, I'm very, very aware of just what a sort of musical institution that is to the UK. I know how many people are watching and it's become such, such a festival. It, you know, they have... They have events all around the country to celebrate this last night now. Um, and I don't know if it's just because of that memory that it's just a little bit more nervy or it's the heat. But I, I do, I always try to kind of remain exteriorly calm, you know, I don't know, exteriorly calm. I don't know how to say it, but, you know, on the <laughs> external side, I like to look calm. But I know inside, if you put a heart rate monitor on, it would, you know, they'd be uh, getting the ambulance round. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, playing playing in an orchestra on the telly, you, you have to be a good actor. You just have to look calm and, um, you know, you hope that mind over matter takes over at some point. I think you're just very aware, you know, you're just very aware that people are watching. And actually, is one student wrote to me this morning, and we've just done the, the Holst, and she actually texted me and said, uh, did you ban the television from looking at you during the prompt? <laughs> I was like being all kind of poised and elegant. And actually, I wasn't even on the telly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's more disappointing? <laughs> Trust me, it was fine. You should have seen my hair. It was OK. It was all OK. <laughs> You are such an experienced orchestral player in so many different settings and I'm curious, what is your favorite excerpt to play? Maybe even <laughs> just for English horn, if we can help you narrow it, narrow it down Thank a little you. bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, right. Which one to play or which one do I play when it, which do I really like when it's over? I think that, that there's two, there's two things there. <laughs> so um, I, talking about being on the telly, we did uh, Tristan and Isolde uh, with uh, Bitchcoff a few years ago at the proms. And that, that has to be one of the most terrifying experiences I've ever done in my life. And I mean, because the, the first process was actually uh, being with Bitchkoff, who, I mean, he really, God, did he know that piece. And um, I, he took me aside for half an hour to give me like a personal masterclass, one-to-one on how to play the solo from Tristan. Now, uh, that was worth millions as far as I was concerned. It was incredible. He talked about 
the importance of Wagner's um, uh, dynamic markings, what he actually meant by that little accent there and this little slur there. And it was, it really, I mean, I really felt that by performing that particular solo, I really knew what it was about. The actual event was um, standing in the middle of the audience uh, with the <laughs> with the rest of the uh, Albert Hall being put into pitch blackness and just a spotlight and a television camera up my nose. Now that that was terrifying, I have to say. But again, you look poised, and I feel again whenever I have to play that, I feel quite. Um, Oh, I, I have an ownership of it, which sounds particularly trite, really. But it, it, I just I just feel that Bitchkoff taught me so well that I know how that goes now. Um, another one that we've done recently is uh, the Swan of uh, Chinella. I mean, because even though, like, what an excerpt. <laughs> and we've done that with uh, uh, Zachary, who's our principal uh, conductor, and he's Finnish. So uh, we did a few years ago uh, in a concert at the Barbican. And he sat with me for a little bit, just kind of... He, Zachary's approach is very different to Bitchkoff's because Zachary would go, I think I'd like it a little bit like this, but actually you bring what you want to the table and we'll see what happens after that. And um, and then we recorded it, so it's going to be coming out on CD with Shandos quite soon. But you, it's very rare to actually be able to perform that with a Finnish conductor who has been brought up with it. So, so I really loved that, just the, the, the pride, as it were, of performing this epic Cor Anglais excerpt with one of the greatest Finnish conductors that there are and just feeling just so proud of that moment. So, I mean, they're the two big ones. Um, I think for fun, um, I love the three-cornered hat. And again, it's, it's interesting, actually, just thinking That's about it. A lot of the excerpts, the excerpts come into their own when you've actually done them. And it's a conductor that's just added that little bit of magical sparkle to, to bring something alive. Um, yeah. So we, we had um, a Spanish conductor who, who, um, you know, he goes, da, 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 da. There's this moment in between the, um, where there's a hiatus and he was saying, oh, in this moment, the Spanish orchestras go, ole. And, and so now, um, just before that last little sort of interlude, I always think, ole. And then carry on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sort of, who would have thought it, you know? Uh, so, yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's three <laughs> for the past one. <laughs> that, that was awesome. Um, so... Please correct me if I'm wrong or if this is not your experience, but in my experience, playing the cor anglais or English horn, it's difficult to project all the way to the back of the hall, but also the color or timbre of the instrument stands out enough that it's also difficult to blend when you have to blend with the rest of the wind section. Is that your experience too, or do you have any tips about you know, fitting fitting in when you need to fit in and then coming out when you need to come out? Um, uh, well, it's a really interesting dilemma, isn't it? Because uh, as you say, it's like the coronglae is a solo instrument, but also can be like fourth flute in Mahler. Um, I think I've become, again, I sound so bling. It really isn't. I mean, you know, we can talk about crooks or vocals or whatever, but I've become more and more obsessed <laughs> with gold. <laughs> just, oh, so I, I, you know, gold, gold is like the way forward. And so I have this gold plated crook and I use gold plated staples. Uh, trade secrets coming out now. Oh, but well, I think, now I want one so badly. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and I, but again, it's all down to the individual and, and whether it's psychological or not, I, who cares? It works for me. Um, and what I think that uh, the gold-plated thing does for me in terms of projection is that um, you get the projection of a, like a regular silver crook, uh, but with the gold, it just somehow rounds the sound a bit and just, I don't know, cuts that edge off. So mm -hmm. it just warms things up a bit, but you still get the projection. But you still project. Yeah. And I think... Yeah. I, you know, and so I really, 
I really dig that. Really go for it. The other thing I do is I actually play on slightly longer reads than a lot of other people. And, um, and I don't know what that does, but it, again, <laughs> it works for me. <laughs> you know, I sort of, I don't know what the answers are because it's sort of ultimately you just kind of do what you do, don't you? Um, in terms of blending, I think the one of the things I've realised over the years is um, it's very easy to, when you're in an orchestra, to become a little bit kind of self-obsessed. Um, and I mean that in a kind of a, a non-egotistical way. It, it, it's like you kind of, you hear yourself obviously louder than everybody else. So what I say to my students uh, is that in that situation, when you have to grovel around and you're very aware that you're having to play a loud B and it feels like, <laughs> it feels like a fog or doesn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, there's two things I think of. The first one is, you know, the composer put me down here, right? So if the composer put me down there, most composers and orchestrators know the instruments that they're writing for. So they should know that it's going to sound like a foghorn. So that's what they must want. So that's the first thing, right? Excellent point. Absolutely. If they, mm -hmm. you know, they could have put it on a clarinet. They don't sound like foghorns down there. So you know, <laughs> there is that thing. The second point is that when um, in that environment, I have to trust myself. So I kind of remove myself from the equation and put my focus often actually to the bass clarinet. So it's like the furthest wind player I can find and listen to what they're doing. Um, or, you know, sort of, I listen to the person that's furthest away from me and really kind of listen to the harmonies around me. So I'm not worried about how loud I am because it, it's more about just listening to everybody else and not focusing on myself um that's that's kind of what's helped me I have to say anyway <laughs> that's great advice I love it do you have an embarrassing musical moment that you can tell us about loads <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean where do you begin <laughs> the, the, <clears throat> there's <laughs> I think most most of them are, you know, apart from coming to work without reads or your music or, you know, uh, I have never managed to actually walk on stage without wearing the correct clothes. But, I, you know, I think often it's always around Marla. I think Marla is my nemesis. And I've, mm -hmm. I've come to try to prevent anything about Marla that can go wrong in the future. But I think... Um, Oh, one of the Marlers where you have to change over from, you know, get your extension out of the B to the B flat thing. It must have been Marler 1. And it, you have no time to do it. You have no time to take your bell off, put the extension on, take the extension off. And then, you know, you're always worried that nine out of ten times the B flat's not going to work anyway. So why have you put yourself through the stress of trying to make it work? <laughs> um, so but I remember in one performance and the things with the BBC radio uh, orchestra, but the BBC, everything is recorded for radio and often they're live on Radio 3. And I think I must have probably given half the world a heart attack one night because I was busy swapping over crook, not crook, uh, bell and extension, put the bell on my slippery satin dress. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And then, of course, what happens? It's round, it rolls, it fell off my skirt, <laughs> and it made its way to the first violin. <laughs> oh, no! um, I'm now then in a situation where I have no bell, there's a microphone. I mean, I know the, the guys in the sound box, they, they did spill their tea because all they heard was bang! <laughs> and then roll, 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 roll. I mean, it must have looked like a landmine. And then all the time I'm like, was it me? It wasn't me. I'm sitting there being all serene. But of course, the evidence is there is only one Coronglay player in the orchestra. And it is a Coronglay bell that's rolled to the front desk of the first violins. <laughs> So I um, I sat there all serene, you know, thinking I'm not going to play bees for a while. I'll just stick to my C's, see what happens. And then during the concert, uh, the, the bell was passed back to me. Um, so it was so that prompted me to buy a spare coronglay. So I never mid-concert 
swap over uh, extensions. I have my two, and it sounds, I mean, this is the thing. It's like, you know, it's not because I'm, I want to have lots of instruments. It's just, it's just to save face. I have an instrument <laughs> that prevents me from humiliating myself. So I just pick it up, the B flat's there, put it down, swap over, read, we're off. So, yeah. <laughs> That was amazing. I have <laughs> tears running down my face. My makeup is done. <laughs> my favorite part is that you were just like, what? Did someone drop something? <laughs> Rude. Who would do that? <laughs> oh, okay. Considering your busy schedule, how do you prioritize making the most of your practice time and still having a life? Um, well, I don't know if you find this, but I find that, um, there's never that much time for practice. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, you, and it sounds really bad. You know, it's like with orchestral staff, I think, um, oh God, I'm going to sound really bad, aren't I? But if I manage half an hour of practice a day, shh, don't tell anybody this, but I'm happy. <laughs> I'm really happy. Um, if something big's coming up, then I will do three hours, but it is, it's all about the preparation. If I've done six hours sitting in an orchestra, I mean, like, I don't want to play anymore. I've had fun, you know, the yeah. end. There's mm-hmm. a lot of preparation with reads. And I say that most of my inverted commas practice time is actually read making time. It's not mm-hmm. about learning the notes. The beauty, I should not say this, it's actually really bad, <laughs> but I often quip with other Koronglay players. You know, the beauty of playing the Koronglay is that actually most of the stuff's slow. So the, <laughs> a lot of it, <laughs> we're not, we're not learning notes. It's all about beauty. And, you know, you can do a lot of mental practice. And I, I think for me, it's a lot about the sensations of kind of moving through a fair phrase. It's not necessarily trying to figure out how to play a top C, you know, like third octave, not just like a, like a regular top C. I do know how to play that. Uh, but, you know, sort of just, um, just that feeling of where you want it to go and kind of listening uh, again to what's around you. Uh, so it's not, I, I have to, I mean, I just don't have the time living in London. Um, life is busy. So um, you grab a few minutes here in between lessons of teaching and maybe, you know, sort of 15 minute warm up before work starts and it's these precious moments, but I think what's brilliant is it becomes really super efficient practice. You have five minutes here, boom, you've got it. Um, yeah, so that that's that's that. In terms of balancing my life, um, I'm quite disciplined um, with making sure I do some form of exercise every day. Um, and that's kind of a that's just how it has to be for me. You know, I, I think it's important uh, to kind of de- get all this adrenaline out. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one that finds playing in an orchestra at times, you know, it's quite, you just feel the importance of it. I, 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 I will respect it. Maybe it is a better way to, to put it, but I just find going for a run or doing some yoga. It's important to kind of reset yourself. So yeah, meet friends. Friends are super important, you know, outside of work. Yeah. So you don't do practice. what advice do you have for a young musician who aspires to have a career like yours um i would say that don't close down any options um as i said right at the beginning you, you know, there's so many incredible opportunities available. Music courses at conservatoires these days are amazing. There's so much, there's so much going on. There's so many opportunities, uh, be it learning how to play jazz, learning how to wind, rep- you know, in, uh, repair wind instruments. You know, you can you can think that um, you want to do something like play in an orchestra or whatever, but I think it's it's. I wouldn't close off opportunities too soon as I said again it's very important to have a wide base wide interests wide skill set so I I, it's not that my career is I don't know I have a as I said a hodgepodge of stuff not a path it's just been various opportunities that I've grasped with both hands it has been so wonderful to get to talk to you Alison 
how about we close with the um, upcoming performances you have that you're excited about? And if you would like our listeners to find you on the internet, where can they find you? Oh, golly, I have a really outdated website, which I would hate anybody to look at. And it's kind of on my to-do list of things to do. Um, so, yeah, I have a, a dreadful website, um, uh, which is alisonteal.com. Um, and that definitely needs work. But I'm sort of in the middle of um, moving house. And it's uh, there's, there's certain things of my life that are sort of on the back burner. So internet, um, website stuff is definitely on there. Um, as I said, other things, uh, we've got the next two months with uh, the proms. And that's I'm really looking forward to that. And again, uh, I know my little wind, my little oboe band, we're going to, we've got a few little things lined up over the next couple of months. But I think most interestingly, what I'm quite keen to to do again in the next year or so year or two years is another um, coronglay cd i did one oh i think it was 2011 yeah. um i have this real passion to encourage more people to play the english horn because it is actually it's such a beautiful instrument in its own right and i know that when i was a, a young kid picking it up for the first time the music available is actually pretty dull it's all slow and hard <laughs> so playing slow long music is just really physically draining so i'm sort of always commissioning new little pieces and uh, want to get another cd out that's got new pieces on that sort of will help people from we have grade six i don't know what the equivalent would be in the match you do grades in america the associated board schools or no but your student hannah was recently on and explained it to all of us american oh. audiences <laughs> That we had a lot of questions, and I think she was like, uh. <laughs> Right. So, but, so we have a, a loose understanding a, a loose of how understanding. it works. So grade six, normally that would be, I guess these days it's like 14, 15-year-olds if you're kind of, you know, um, be playing for a, at a sort of half serious level on the oboe anyway. And, um, and there's just not that music available that's fun and enjoyable. I mean, because the corombe is an instrument that in orchestra brings death and doom to the table <laughs> all the time. <laughs> is, oh, look, I'm going to fall in love and then die. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> you know, that, that's it. And I just thought, you know, there's more to life than playing sad love songs. So um, so that that's kind of my mission um whether it's on a cd or just various little kind of internet things that so that's that's my game my aim over the next couple of years to kind of um, release a few more bits and bobs yeah well please let us know when you have and we would love to share that with our listeners okie dokie will do <laughs> thank you so much allison this thank has been you. a joy well, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, uh, it's been very interesting to speak to you both and uh, keep going with the podcast. It's really great. Well done. As always, you can find us on all of our social media at Double Read Dish. And if you're on Instagram and want to follow us individually, we are at Wilson Bassoon and Hello Oboe. Don't forget to join us next time where we'll have an interview with Nancy Garris, principal bassoon of the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra. Uh, also, if you would not mind rating and reviewing us on iTunes, that'll help even more people learn about Double Read Dish. Okay, Jackie, I think it's time to end the nerd parade. Go make reads. <laughs>